Magic in the current update of combat has felt a little bit lackluster to say the least. However, I believe learning this combat style is fundamental to really understanding the combat system. And the lessons it can teach will definitely carry on down the road and turn you into a better PVMer. So welcome on into my Magic DPS guide. A quick disclaimer here, just like in the other two guides, I will not claim to be the best major or anything like that. I simply have done the combat style for quite a while, have learned some of its ins and outs and I'm here to pass on the information to y'all. There will be time codes in the description below for any points of interest you may have from anything including worn equipment to my inventory to any specific piece of gear, relics, the different spell books, different spells to use, ability information and rotations, whatever your heart may desire. And again, I'm just providing some information for you to add in as you see fit. Take as much or little information from this guide that you need to improve your own magic DPM. Also, if you want to go above and beyond and support this channel, there are super thanks and memberships available for those who want to go well into the stratosphere as far as support is concerned. But if you don't want to do any of that, I fully understand. Simply subscribing to this channel helps out a lot more than you know. Also, leaving comments down below and liking the video, should you have found it helpful, is always going to be very good support. Anyways, let's actually get into this guide. But getting right into it, we'll take a look here at the worn equipment. Now, you may have noticed I am wearing anima core Sliske armor, specifically the refined version. And you might have seen this pop up in a couple different live streams or maybe some record videos that happen to involve magic. And the reason for it is, is on the armor set, you can go ahead and right click and hit select effect. That'll bring up this menu here and you're able to choose if you own the entire Tusca War preset, you can then select the Tusca's Might effect and that gives you an increased chance for critical strike, which during FSOA is more powerful than having no set effect on the elite tech, but having the higher damage bonuses simply because of how crit reliant FSOA is. Now also something convenient with this armor set is if you want to bring in something like stat warhammer or something like that you don't have the massive penalty that you do with other armor sets because it is hybrid or if you want to do some type of sgb swap that can work out really nicely so it does allow flexibility in those departments and it's technically best in slot because of a set effect however they have stated that they want to do some type of set effect for elite tech there are no concrete plans as far as i am aware from the j mods on saying anything about that or what it's going to be so if you don't want to get into the Sliske armor, the mini game requirement is rather obnoxious. It's about four hours to get the Tusca War Priest if you have none of the points or pieces for it. And the armor itself, I think, is around 140, maybe 160 mil for the refined version. But for those wondering why people are running around with Sliske hybrid armor, that is the reason. Carapact wrist wraps here are best in slot for magic if you are not able to poison the boss. If you are able to poison the boss just go ahead and wear cinderbane gloves it's going to do more damage but with carapax wrist wraps if you have the enhanced version that's just from the artifact that you get from art glycore you can buy these for pretty cheap and you can just buy the enhanced pair right off the ge should you want and basically how these gloves work is as you see right here for six seconds after using the dragon breath ability damage dealt from the combust ability will happen instantly and deal 25 percent more damage and if you have the enchantment purchased from the xamarin rock dungeon uh, you craft it with those slivers and a couple other items it will further that damage by another 15 percent now there are some pretty sweat methods with these where you use it in combination with lunging so you get a bunch of additional hits and you can also walk the target on tick and get the 1.5 x multiplier comboed in with the extra 40 percent damage here and it can be a lot of damage however i don't really see people taking advantage of this too much because it is pretty tick sensitive and also it's a lot of inputs for a minimal gain but it is something there if you're trying to absolutely maximize your magic damage blast diffusion boots are the best in slot boot for magic they basically just half the time requirement for detonate to get to its full charge and if you want to go for the enhanced version they're tier 90 instead of tier 80 and give a little bit of extra magic damage bonus but honestly it's not really worthwhile it is if you have quite literally nothing else to spend your gp on it's 
one of the last upgrades you'll do, considering the spikes are around 200 mil still. However, they are there for people who want it. Grim is absolutely best in slot for magic, being that FSOA is very crit reliant on its spec. We'll talk about FSOA a bit later on in more detail, but suffice to say, Grim with its 12% crit chance is absolutely mandatory for high end best in slot magic damage. And magic camp happens to be a pretty chill method for solo Solax. So if you want to get your own Grim pages and not have to buy them, then feel free to do that method as it works just fine. Crazels are still the best in slot dual wield weapons for magic. They are T92. They come from AOD and they are very strong. A lot of people will debate the cost versus actual damage output on seismics versus praisals. However, if you have the GP, just get the praisals and don't worry about it too much. I will make a note that put Potentially, we might see T95 dual wield this year, so if you do want to play it safe and you're working on a little bit of a shoestring budget, then consider just staying on Seismics if you have those. The T95 dual wield is mostly just uh, being hinted at by the devs in a live stream they did where they somewhat kind of hinted at a boss coming this year. And on X, formerly known as Twitter, a few J mods asked what we would like to see as rewards from a potential boss in the future or potential content in the future and most people seem to have said tier 95 dual wield or some type of magic update so i can understand some cost saving measures if you're not exactly just loaded with gp and just want to stick with seismics for now and you're not really maging too much but as of right now in this combat update praisals are definitely best in slot magic is really the only other combat style that allows you to just equip zamorgiel's nexus free of charge and get the full effect out of bone shield and the reason for that being you don't have to wear some type of quiver to hold ammo or maybe armor spikes for melee or if you're sweating melee having a quiver there for a greco swap but i digress and it's really nice because you can just set that here you set your room pouches in your inventory and you're off to the races and you don't have to change anything channeler's ring is a very consistent option for damage with magic being that g conk is the bread and butter ability of magic dpm and the way that channeler's ring works is on any channeled ability so things like g Conk, ABF spec, asphyxiate. These abilities get a compounding crit chance increase, starting with 4% and increasing by 4% each additional hit. So basically, this ring just buffs the ever living heck out of G Conk and your two hit is fixed that you'll be doing. And if you're still using ABS EOF, but I only really see people using that at Zamorak, I don't see it being used anywhere else really. But with the enchantment, it is also nice because it'll give you a crit strength damage buff so when your abilities do crit they will strike a little bit stronger and overall it's definitely not a bad ring to have for magic camp as far as eofs are concerned i will go ahead and talk about the specs that go in them for magic later on in the video but for those who don't know essence of finality combines the soul amulet and the reaper necklace and you gain the benefits from both which it basically makes your soul split healing do a lot more work you get an additional 10 percent damage reduction on your overhead prayers and as as you attack a target, you get up to 3% more accuracy when attacking. Zuck Cape is very strong for magic and is borderline a requirement for doing really good magic damage. Requirement might be a strong word, but what I'm trying to say is that it is very, very strong. Omni Power goes from one hit costing 100% adrenaline to 60% base cost and hitting up to five hits. Now, the individual hits are not as strong as a single Omni Power hit without it but trust me the damage is definitely there and yes you don't need the hybrid version it just makes your presets nicer because you don't have to worry about which cape goes where and having the bank space free is kind of nice but either the normal mode or the hard mode cape will work definitely get it highly recommend now going into my inventory here we don't have too many things to really go over i do have elite tech here just to represent it as the quote-unquote best in slot magic armor because sliske is classed as hybrid armor this is technically the best in slot magic armor and if you have this and you don't want to buy the sliske that's perfectly fine it's going to be getting a set effect at some point who knows when it's coming in but hopefully sooner rather than later or if you're even just rocking the tier 90 version of this armor you'll do just fine it still works perfectly fine it didn't get a nerf or anything it's just we discovered something that has a i believe it's two percent increase to overall damage so if you just want to stick with tectonic feel free to don't feel super pressured into getting sliske now as far as the weapons are concerned we have a couple bread and butter 
switches here, one of them being the Fractured Staff of Armadil. This is an absolute mainstay in terms of magic damage because the special attack has a hit that it does itself and it is relatively strong. I believe it hits a six or a seven K, something around that for a hit inside of your sun. And it costs 50% base adrenaline with no effects or anything like that. And it gives you a 30 second window for whenever you deal a critical strike. It will then just add an additional ability hit out for that crit. So the more crits you get, the more damage you do. Inquisitor Staff is the Hex Hunter Bow of Magic. It is technically a tier 80, but it has an effect where it does an additional lot of damage and accuracy when fighting against melee enemies. Now, this isn't necessarily based on if they do a lot of melee autos. The class of enemy is going to be different, and you'll have to look up on the wiki, but all you have to do is go over here to the search wiki and then type in in quiz and then hit enter it'll bring it up on your default browser and if i just bring that over here you can then full screen this and scroll down and then you'll get a list of different bosses there's some recommended ones there's some not recommended ones and there's also a list of slayer mobs that it works on so if you're curious if a boss works it'll either tell you over here if you're looking at a boss and it has this little area here on a boss page it'll tell you if something is susceptible to inquisitor or you can come here to this wiki page and you can get the list of everything that it works on here now as far as these separate offhands here are concerned i kind of have them in order from most used personally to least used starting with you have a caroming swap here now caroming boosts the number of hits that greater chain can potentially go to from three all the way to seven and is very very strong for anything that you need aoe damage with for instance if you're clearing out elite dungeons this one is really nice because you don't have to get things in shin range and sometimes can be more advantageous to do a mob clearing scenario with chroming on a greater chain rather than doing that but basically chroming highly recommended if you're doing anything that involves aoe now it doesn't really matter what tier weapon you put this on i would recommend anything above tier 85 because greater chain itself it's that damage doesn't matter so much like it can in some very specific situations but the offhand tier on a weapon and swap like Karoming isn't really going to matter too much because it's not the G chain hit itself we're looking for. It's the effect that it does with an ability after that. But we'll get into that a little bit more on the ability information. Blanking is a very powerful swap and it buffs the impact and deep impact abilities. This one is slightly more important depending on what weapon it's on. So I would probably recommend either a T88, 90, or a 92 if you really want to go fancy. To hold your flanking because the ability it's affecting is the damage you're actually looking to increase. You're not looking for an effect after flanking. So I would recommend this one being on the highest tier you have available. Now this swap here is kind of a meme swap. There are a few specific situations that I use it in and most of the time that's on static targets that can't be buffed by the 2x multiplier that combust has because launching will increase the damage of combust but it reduces the multiplier to one and a half instead of two times for walked targets. And I do have to give mention to some tech surrounding this where if you are using carapact wrist wraps, like I mentioned before, there is a way and I believe it is a tick perfect walk timed with your dragon breath where if you have the lunging applied combust and you de breath on the same tick as a walk, you will get the one and a half times multiplier with the increased damage and hits from the lunging perk plus the effects of the carapact wrist wrap all stacked into one it's pretty sweaty to do and if you want to do it to maximize magic dpm feel free by all means i personally only use lunging for a static target and that's about it and honestly i rarely ever use it this one's a fresh one i kind of bought it more so as an example i used to have one that was maybe level three or four but i did want to bring this up regardless because there are some specific use cases where you might want a lunging swap. Now as far as EOFs are concerned for magic, there's only three that I can really think of. There isn't like a ridiculous number that I can think of. Now as far as EOFs are concerned, I can only think of three main EOFs that I would actually use, not counting off style switches. Off style SGB is absolutely going to be used in most magic camp rotations because of how strong it is, especially if you're using hybrid armor, but I talked about that before. And first here we have Gothic Staff. This was the best in 
slot magic damage for a long, long time, basically since EOF came out. It is a very strong hit for only 25% damage, and it also reduces the defense on a target by attacking its affinity, kind of like how a stat hammer works, but a stat hammer is a little bit more powerful than G staff. And overall, it's a very nice tool to have. You can also replace this with a Zamorak staff, and that will attack the magic level of the target that you are dealing with. And I've seen people use Z staff at Karapak to help a little bit with damage reduction for phase four. And there's probably a couple other places that could use something like this. So that is just something to keep in mind. Now, ever since the combat update came into game, we now have the Iben staff, which is basically just a double the cost, but double the damage version of the Guthic staff. It does a lot of damage. It's 50% adrenaline base cost and is very nice for sunshine rotations. When it crits and you have everything going in your sunshine, you'll see this thing pop off with a 26 to 28k. When it doesn't crit, it's a little bit sad. It's like a 17k. But overall, I've been using Iben's staff a lot more than I have my Guthic staff. Overall, it is a solid EOF and it's a quest item that only costs 200k. So it's actually one of the cheapest EOFs I can think of as far as what goes into the necklace is concerned. And the last one I have here is an Armidal Battle Staff. This used to be the bread and butter of magic rotations before the FSOA got nerfed. And honestly, the only reason I still have it is because I paid 110 mil for it and I'm kind of copium waiting for something to happen where it's more worthwhile. I've seen it used throughout the Zami fight for anyone using magic, so it is something to consider if that's a boss you really want to get into. However, this EOF has not really gotten much use from me ever since FSOA nerf. However, it is something kind of like the lunging swap. It's something I want to bring up and bring to your attention in case you find a use case for it in your rotations. I do have a Reaver's Ring here just to bring up because Reaver's Ring will buff all of your abilities by a flat 5%, whereas Channeler's Ring only really works on Gricko and Asphyxiate. I mean, it technically works on Tendies, but I don't really think it helps with the crit chance on the additional hits that it fires. And even if it does, that is also kind of a small use case. And as of right now, I really don't know which is better. I think if you're magic camping, it's still better to go with Channeler's Ring as far as average damage is concerned, whereas Reaver's Ring has a higher potential damage, but also has a lower potential. If any of you know what a bell curve is, Channeler's Ring is going to have a thinner bell curve, so you'll have a better average as far as your damage is concerned, but your high and low end potential will be definitely more towards the center. Whereas on a Reaver's Ring, it's going to be a fatter bell curve because you have a potential for a lot lower damage, but you're also going to have a potential for higher damage. Also, Reaver's Ring, I believe, is cheaper at the time of recording than the Channeler's Ring, and it works with all combat styles, so there's nothing really wrong with getting it. Experiment with both and see which one you like better at any given boss. The last thing I have here that is worth mentioning is Cinderbane Gloves. These are pretty self-explanatory. Anything that is poisonable, Cinderbane is going to be best in slot. There's nothing fancy you have to do. You just equip them and forget about them. Kind of a set and forget type of deal. And then as you're doing damage to a boss, you'll get more poison procs and do more damage. Now for this part of the gear discussion, I'm going to talk about more of like the supporting types of gear. And that's going to be relics, the actual rune pouches I have, and the spell books and which ones I use and how I go between those. So for starters, we'll just talk about the spell book options. I typically will sit on ancients. And if I need to swap to lunars, I have all the runes set up so I can just swap to lunars, get access to any spell I need here, like vengeance or if i want to disrupt shield i can go ahead and do that and if i need to swap to normals for anything like say i don't want to waste money on vuln bombs and i don't mind wasting an extra tick in order to four tick in a vulnerability spell you can do that or at some bosses you might actually want the damage reduction from enfeeble so you can swap to normals you can cast your enfeeble get your 10 percent damage reduction for a minute and you're automatically back on ancients and you want ancients because you want to be able to auto cast insight fear and exsanguinate and if you're going to get into four ticking you can four tick in blood barrage or ice barrage as you need for that extra damage and extra healing potential what these two spells do is essentially they build stacks respectively based on the number of ability hits going out not counting bleeds so if i have insight fear here and i go ahead and attack you'll see auto attacks do not build up the stacks but if i click G-Conk, 
it then goes up to three. If I press, press a bleed, it will only count as one, not the additional bleed hits is what I meant to say earlier. And then you press the fifth ability, you get your fifth stack. And on the fifth stack, it'll actually do a small AOE ice spike in a, I believe it's a five by five, or maybe it's a seven by seven area. It's definitely a five by five area, not seven by seven. But the real thing you wanna use insight fear for is if we go ahead and build up our stacks here. We build up to five and then we go ahead and press tsunami as you can see it brings the cost down considerably for tsunami where it was only 20 percent adrenaline because the insight fear is doing 60 percent i have the ring of vigor passive that's doing another 10 percent because it's an ultimate and i have the coe relic on i'll talk about relic specifics later but the coe relic is saving me 10 percent there so it is very low adrenaline cost for tsunami which makes it very convenient for getting off inside of rotations and giving you that sweet sweet crit adrenaline buff that we all have come to love now how exsanguinate works is the base idea is the same you're using ability hits and you know extra bleed hits don't count it's just the base bleed that counts g conk is three because it does three hits during g conk is three because it's a channel that gives out three hits so on and so forth but you can build up to 12 stacks here and what happens at 12 stacks is you then get a 12 percent damage buff on all of your basic abilities so your g conks buffed by 12 your combusts your corruption blasts your dragon breath your baby flank all of these abilities get a damage buff but the fun thing that happens is rack turns into rack and ruin so if i go ahead and set the spells here and then i just go ahead and attack a dummy for a little bit as you can see we will build up stacks here and i'll just try and build these up as quick as possible and if i hit this g conk we will be here at 12 and then as you can see the rack has changed it is now rack and ruin but essentially what happens when you press this ability is it'll consume all of your stacks for exsanguinate and it will do a bunch of additional damage for rack and the same thing applies with if you ice rag it in on a stunnable or bindable target you will get an additional increase with that and another cool effect this has is if you press this and you press combust within a 10 second window you will get an additional two hits on your combust and yes this is stackable with lunging and all of the other goodness so it is nice to weave into rotations here and there however most of the time it's better not to use this ability and just have the increased damage on all of your basics however that is more of a boss specific thing in my opinion and not so much a flat damage choice now as far as the other spells are concerned you have the four barrage spells here uh, ice barrage will just stun things and bind them in place for 9.6 seconds it's nice for breaking freedoms at telos freezing targets in place buffing regular rack or rack and ruin as far as damage is concerned it is a very useful auto to have blood barrage just heals you so every time you foretech an auto like this in you can get some additional healing back from the auto damage it does shadow barrage just reduces the target's damage dealt by five seconds you could kind of switch between these different autos before fsoa got nerfed because it was actual auto hits going out so you could use things like smoke barrage which reduces the uh, hit chance of the boss onto you by five percent but now if you want to get these effects you can four tick them in however most people just auto cast blood barrage or if they want to save runes they can four tick in blood blitz and ice blitz respectively a couple other useful spells you might use on here are things like intercept which will take all the damage from another player and bring it onto you for 10 seconds so at places like Zamorak you'll see people uh devo septing each other which is using devotion and praying the overhead and taking the damage away from the base and essentially no damage is taken as any stun effects are not applied to you as far as I'm aware I have seen things like ruby aurora get four ticked in to help increase the damage of those people around them however that's more of a group encounter thing like intercept is the only prism I really use on this one is prism of restoration this, this is helpful for buffing up your familiars if they're a little bit low on hp like the hellhound or the blood reaver familiar basically you just stand next to this after you pop it wait about 10 seconds and your familiar is pretty much going to be on full hp very handy spell to have and then as far as the other spell books are concerned if i swap over i pretty much only use disruption shield and vengeance from this spell book there are some very niche use cases where heal other 
other can be nice. Again, this is for group encounters. I know this is used at Rago to do what's known as crack healing. If you want to know more about that, there's plenty of Rago guides out there that will happily explain this to you. I have seen people use spiritualized healing in the past. You know, if you forget to summon a familiar for the upcoming hour and you're in the middle of a kill, you can go ahead and use this to then extend the life of your familiar by 20%. That is getting you through the kill. Go back to the bank and then summoning a new familiar. And honestly, I almost never swap to standards. There isn't really anything here that I use. Again, like I stated before, you can swap to Enfeeble or swap for Enfeeble, I should say. But this is a hyper niche use case that I only really see used at like Zamorak or maybe a 4K Glacor. I could see it being used, but that's about it. All right, now that I've rambled on long enough about spell books and all the different effects and whatnot of the different spells, those are the main ones I can think of. There's probably some other hyper niche use case spells that are nice in either group settings that I don't really know much about. But if you know about any of these, feel free to leave it in the comments below. As far as relics are concerned, I pretty much just use Death Ward, Fury of the Small, and COE. COE is absolutely a mainstay of magic. There's no real reason to use heightened senses over it as you're using Sunshine to get the adrenaline save, which heightened senses technically can take over, but it really helps out with Tsunami and Omni Power both being used inside of Sunshine. And the 10% adrenaline save on those abilities alone make it worthwhile to use COE over heightened senses. Now, if you want to go full damage mode, you can skip out on Fury of the Small and just go for straight Berserker's Fury with something like Font of Life, and that will give you more damage output. Uh, with four ticking, adrenaline gain isn't too much of an issue, and the FOTS really isn't going to make that much of a difference. So if you're able to go ahead and tank the damage at a boss and get away with using Zerk Fury, I would probably use this over Font of Life, but honestly, I'll just take the little bit of extra adrenaline and the safety precaution that Death Ward can provide because I do usually sit on like five or six HP at most bosses. So I'll take the free damage reduction where I can get it. There are some other niche use cases for relic combos that I use, like adding in Luck of the Dwarves and just using Blessing of Het in slot one and three. But this is a hyper specific setup for elite dungeons and I'll cover that in separate guides coming up later on. I would just stick to the basic ones unless you have something really specific you need. Now, as far as rune pouches are concerned, these are the three I have set up here. Feel free to pause the video and set these up accordingly. The grasping rune pouches are nice because if you're equipping one of these, like say you're using a lot of exsanguinate, you could go ahead and equip your grasping pouch to save on rune cost. However, I will just normally equip the nexus for the additional effect on greater bone shield. As you can see, I'm getting a, 70, a tier 75 shield essentially for free, which yes, I think this is OP on the other combat styles, but it's not going to change. I don't think anything I could say could make it change. So I would just be yelling at the clouds about that. But anyways, I digress. As far as my perks are concerned for magic, I am using C4R5, Impatient 4, Devoted 4, Imp 4, Devo 4 could be substituted out for some type of Slayer perk if you need. Devoted 4 isn't hyper needed at most places you're going to be at. You'll be able to divert and do other things and soul split flick your HP back just fine. And then on legs here, I just have Biting 4 by itself because it was a spare gizmo left over. I don't think this armor set is going to be useful for too much longer, maybe a couple months maximum. So I didn't go full out on the Sliskite armor set. And I also have Invigorating 4 because I am doing 4 ticking. And the extra adrenaline on 4 tick autos is definitely nice. And I went ahead and comboed in mobile there because I didn't want to go for a biting combo. It's much cheaper to go for something like Invigorating using the culinary components. And then other than that, I am just following pretty much standard best in slot perks. I have P6 AS1, Aftershock 4, Eruptive 2 on my dual wields, and kind of the same thing P6 R1, AS4 E2 on my staff. The Inquisitor doesn't have Ruthless on it, but it doesn't really matter because I use it at Solak and I don't really get much of a damage buff there anyways. Maybe from arms, legs on decor, but I don't really think it matters too much. Unless you're doing some top, top end speed kills where every tick matters, which I don't. I usually just go ahead and chill solo at Solak. Nothing wrong with going try hard, by the way. It's just something that I don't do as of right now. And then all of these switches I have, I try and incorporate some form of eruptive. I should probably go for flank four eruptive two at some point because it is actually just flat out better now. Before with equilibrium, it was kind of limiting on top end, but that is something I will probably do once tier 95 dual wield comes out and I just 
go full try hard with magic and do like a bunch of died t95 offhands and whatnot but that has not come into game yet and probably won't for a little while so i have time to save up that pretty much sums up everything as far as equipment involving magic camping is concerned let's get into some ability information now as far as abilities are concerned we have basic abilities threshold abilities and ultimate abilities basic abilities generate adrenaline but do decent amounts of damage although nothing spectacular threshold abilities consume 15 percent adrenaline per cast but they do a increased amount of damage compared to their basic counterparts and ultimate abilities consume a lot of adrenaline typically 100 adrenaline base but do a lot of damage or give you some type of effect or what they can do is give you a time window in which all other abilities do an increased amount of damage as far as basic abilities are concerned g conk is the bread and butter of magic dpm this is the one you're going to be pressing pretty much every three abilities assuming you're not four ticking but we'll go over four ticking later on as it is an important part of magic dpm but anyway i dig Anyways, G-Conk works by doing three hits in one global cooldown. It is a channeled ability, and it does increase damage and crit chance per hit. So hit two is going to do a bit more damage and have more potential to crit, as well as hit three will have even more damage and more of a crit chance, even more so than the second hit, which when it's stacked with Channeler's Ring makes it a very consistent high damaging basic to do, and its cooldown is short, only 5.4 seconds. So you can do this every third ability. Rack by itself is an okay ability for basic. It's nice for generating adrenaline, but its main strength is when you combo with something like Ice Barrage on a stunnable or bindable target, then you get an additional damage increase and it does a little bit better damage then and is actually worthwhile to press. Typically, you should be using other basic abilities over Rack unless you have Rack and Ruin, then that one has its niche use cases like I explained before. Overall, not a bad ability, but definitely not the best. Dragon Breath is is a very strong basic that is also an AoE. You can think of this like cleave for melee, except it has the extended range of magic and it does pretty good damage. It's definitely worthwhile. It also has some effects with care packs, wrist wraps, if you happen to be using those. So I explained this earlier in the gears section, but it is a strong basic overall. Impact is the basic stun for magic and it does okay damage, not really, but it does get affected by flanking. So if you have a flanking swap, it will absolutely do increased damage and is worthwhile to use. Combust and Corruption Blast are the two bleeds. Combust is kind of like Frag Shot, where if you hit it, it'll do a base amount of damage for a set number of hits, but if you move the target, it'll do double the damage. So it is nice to use in certain places and is actually worthwhile to use in your rotations, assuming you are able to move the target. But even if it's a static target, it is just a nice filler ability because it does damage over time. Corruption Blast, on the other hand, though, is I believe the second strongest basic that magic has to offer. g -Conk, I believe, is stronger than it, but it is a bleed that will then go to other targets in the vicinity. So for AoE damage, it's very strong, but the bleed itself is still pretty strong. And the initial hit will be very strong, and then it will taper off in damage as it keeps going. Now that's mostly dual-wield basic. The only variety in two-hander we have is Magma Tempest and Greater Sonic Wave. Greater Sonic Wave shares a cooldown with g -Conk and is not worthwhile to use use in the slightest in my opinion it was dead on arrival i don't really see any point in using it but as far as general magic rotations are concerned g sonic is kind of a meme and should probably be avoided magma tempest on the other hand got a buff through this combat update and it does i believe an average damage of like 200 percent ability damage so it is a very strong basic now the difference between magma tempest and something like corrupt blast or combust is that its damage is only based on on a three by three area on where you plant it. So if I attack this target, for example, and hit Magma Tempest, you will notice, or it's a five by five, excuse me, but you'll notice anything in this vicinity will take damage over time. So it does act like a bleed in that sense, but you have to be careful on where you plant your Magma Tempest and just keep that in mind because targets can walk out of the bleed, but it is a five by five, not a three by three. Overall, Magma Tempest is probably one of the stronger basics, definitely worthwhile investing into. Also, some people use just the base form of Magma Tempest. Other people use the targeted variety to where you can just plant 
it at any place that you want. This also allows you to sneak out an auto attack, and I believe that is still in this update of combat. However, I don't really use the targeted version of Magma Tempest a whole lot. I just use the basic version because I'm a bit lazy with it. But it is another way for you to sneak in auto attacks should you want to maximize magic's potential damage. I almost forgot about Greater Chain, but this is a very strong basic for AoE clearing. And how it works is if I go ahead and target this dummy and press it, it will hit other targets. And then if I press something like Omni Power, it will then hit all three targets as well. Now the secondary targets being these two here will be on 50% damage of the original hit that you do on the main target. But overall for AOE clearing, it is very strong and it also works with things like detonate, where if I charge it up here and release it, detonate initial hit range will still hit all of its normal intended targets plus an additional hit will go out to secondary targets that got hit by g chain so it does kind of double dip so it is very fun to play with things like tsunami and detonate within your g chain or things like omni power overall very strong ability for aoe clearing especially if you're doing a lot of elite dungeons highly recommend purchasing now as far as thresholds are concerned there are actually quite a few thresholds that are good with magic that being Asphyxiate, Deep Impact, Wild Magic, Smoke Tendrils, and Detonate. These are all strong and worthwhile thresholds in their own respect. Asphyxiate is kind of like the Destroy of Magic, where it is a channeled ability. It does four hits, and it applies a stun on hit one and hit three. Now, it is a strong threshold. However, in most rotations, you will be canceling this after the second hit or third game tick. Some rotations might have you go to the third hit, but that is mostly dependent on the boss you're doing. Deep Impact is your threshold flank ability. It is the threshold version of impact. Therefore, it is also affected by a flanking swap. If you can't flank the target, it's not too bad, but it is kind of weak considering it's only slightly more powerful than something like Dragon Breath, but it costs 15%. I would mostly save this ability for if you need the stun effect that it provides, being that it stuns for 3.6 seconds, or you have access to flanking on the boss that you are killing. Wild Magic is like the snapshot of magic. It does two hits in one global cooldown and they are strong hits. Now unlike Snapshot, having a damage modifier for the second hit based on the first hit, this one just fires two ability hits of 155% damage. Overall strong threshold, definitely worthwhile to get two of these out per sunshine rotation. Smoke Tendrils is a unique ability for magic because it is a channeled ability but the hits are guaranteed to crit so this is kind of your get out of jail free card when doing magic dpm if you're not getting the crits you want you pop your smoke tendrils and you at least have four guaranteed crits to give you some extra adrenaline plus the autos can crit overall very strong but the cooldown is 45 seconds as you can see so you're only going to get one of these out per sunshine rotation and you're not going to do this outside of sun because it's not really worthwhile but overall strong ability detonate is a unique threshold in which you press it and it charges up then you have to press the ability again to release it so in short if i attack this dummy and i press detonate it'll charge it up and then when i press it again it releases the ability. Now, if you're wearing Blast Diffusion Boots, this only takes four ticks to fully charge up. And the unique thing about Detonate is that since when you initially press it, that's when the global cooldown incurs. And so you can release Detonate with other abilities and you can even do like entire armor swaps while under Detonate. So if I attack this dummy here again and I charge up a Detonate, I can like fully swap armor sets. I can swap back. I can swap to a two-hander and then I can release it with an ability and an auto attack if I want to, and it is a lot of damage in a single tick. The only thing you can't do with detonate is move around, so once you are in place, you are there, like if you're using snipe without the fleeting boots. But overall, it is a strong basic. I try to use one in my sunshine rotation because it is a strong ability, but it's also very nice for AoE clearing, like if you're doing an elite dungeon. Overall, strong threshold. Now, as far as ultimate abilities are concerned, there are three main ones that 
you're going to be using and there is one niche one that you can use from time to time in certain situations. The main three you'll be using are Omni Power with the Zuck Cape equipped, Greater Sunshine, and Tsunami. Now if you don't have Greater Sunshine unlocked, you can just use regular Sunshine with a Planted Feet Swap. However, this ability is pretty cheap if memory is serving me correctly, so go ahead and pick one up. It will make your life a lot easier. You then get the full duration and you also get the bleed effect. Now how Greater Sun works is for a 38 second time window, you get a 50% damage increase on all other abilities. And maximizing the amount of damage in said time window is what people will generally refer to as a sunshine rotation. And the idea here is just the fact that you're trying to optimize the best ability usage possible under a sunshine to get the most damage possible out in this increased uh, damage time window. We'll go over specific rotations later, but for for now, I just want to have the basic idea out there. Now, I showcased Tsunami earlier when I was talking about Insight Fear in the Spellbook section, and how it works is this is the ability that works like Incendiary Shot or like Meteor Strike, where when you use it, you get a 30 second window in which you get a 8% adrenaline increase for every time you land a critical strike. Now, this ability, it has a one minute cooldown and so does Sunshine, so we just use it inside of our Sunshine to really maximize the potential damage inside of Sun, but this ability is also an AoE, meaning it will attack everything, and I believe a 3x3 in front of you, but you can attack from distance with it. Where you get the AoE and what targets you can hit with it are a little bit funky, but suffice to say, if I just go ahead and build up here, hit my stacks, and then go ahead and hit Tsunami, you'll notice the targets on the 5x5 ring are not going to get hit by Tsunami, so it is just a 3x3 around the target target. Overall, strong ability, highly, highly recommend using it. Now, the one ultimate that has a niche use case, but is strong where it counts, and that is Metamorph. This ability does basically 66% damage increase instead of the 50, but it only lasts for 15 seconds. Now, if anyone remembers old Metamorph from way back in the day, like the 2013 to 2014 era of RuneScape, this ability used to last 20 seconds and do 75% increased damage, and it was very strong, but it did get a nerf to where now it's only 15 seconds of duration and the 66% increase, but places where this is useful is something like Terraket, where now we have no hit cap really to worry about and we have a salve amulet and the timing window is really nice at Terraket to where you can metamorph phase one and try and go for a skip if you get really lucky but if you don't you can then just metamorph phase three and just truck Terraket down into like I believe the fastest I've seen using that method is around the minute nine to minute eight section I think I may have seen a minute three on old FSOA but I digress I also use metamorph at places like Solak for for phase four, where I'm more so focused on DPS rather than DPM. There are also places like Karapak where you can actually use a metamorph inside of a sunshine. And if you manage to pull this off, they do stack on one another, meaning they will combine their damage output and you will see some ridiculous hits. Now, the way this works is that at Karapak specifically, there is a time warp thing where it will remember the cooldowns and whatnot and adrenaline you had before you pressed it. And then after 10 seconds, it'll bring you you back to that state but leave any effects and abilities you've done in place so if you press the time warp and you press sunshine it will remember that you were at 100 adrenaline before you pressed it so you do that you get everything built up like a nami maybe your fsoa spec then when the time warp pops it'll go back to having no cooldown on your greater sunshine because before you pressed it you had no cooldown there and so your metamorph happens to be on no cooldown so you can just go ahead and pop that and then do like limitless smoke tendrils to get a lot of crit adren and really pump out some damage. Now this only works at Karapak because you're able to negate the shared cooldown between Metamorph and Sunshine using the time warp mechanic. Maybe in the future we'll see something with greater Metamorph and maybe see something where they can both be used at the same time as some type of buff to magic to bring it up to the other styles but that's a discussion for another video. However I think you guys should know what Metamorph does and how it 
functions to be able to add into your rotations as you guys see fit. So as far as sunshine rotations are concerned, you're typically going to want to go for two wild magics, two two hit asphyxes, an omni power, a smoke tendrils, and possibly a detonate with as many EOFs as you can possibly spam in depending on your crit RNG. And as far as spell swapping is concerned, if you're able to build up insight fear stacks before going into a boss, it is ideal. However, if you want to just go bank and go right back into the boss that you're trying to kill and you just want to build them up during the first part of your sun, you can do that just fine. Now, what some people will do when they start their sunshine is they will hit G conk into D breath and then go for a auto Nami only using four out of the five stacks. And that's a little bit more risky to do because it does cost more adrenaline. However, G conk will usually carry and you don't have to limitless your wild magic and your asphyx afterwards. And typically what I'll do is I will just G conk into a D breath, swap to my two hander and then pop something like auto magma tempest or maybe auto corrupt if I place a magma tempest beforehand. That'll get me my fifth stack and then I just immediately Nami FSOA spec and move on. But that would look something like this. I'm going to go ahead and go for the full five insight fear stacks and call it good. But we'll go ahead and target cycle our dummy with our sun sunshine, a pot, G conk into a D breath. And I'm just going to go ahead and auto magma tempest here. Nami swap to Xang. Hit our FSOA spec. Got some nice crits here. G conk into a wild magic. Auto two hit is fix. Do a wield for G conk. Charge up a detonate. Release with Omni power and an auto attack. Another G conk into an Ibin. And here I'll go for an auto tendrils into another Ibin staff spec. G conk into a wild magic. And then auto two hit us fix and call it there. Now, if you are doing something that you can use limitless in the first sunshine and it doesn't really matter too much, you can go ahead and go for just the four insight fear stacks. Or if you want to go above and beyond, what you can do is pre-build some insight fear stacks on these dummies before you go into said boss. It just depends on what you want to do. And I went ahead and used Reaver's Ring there just for the higher potential of crits. And as you saw, when you do get the high rolls for crits, you do get a lot of them and it is very nice. Plus the Sliske effect is coming in very handy there. And when I don't have a pot for a sunshine at most bosses, I find myself in this situation, they usually will give me a good divert so you can use that in place of say your dragon breath or what you can do is pop divert immediately after sun and then just go into jeet conk d breath and you should get a decent amount of adrenaline to then go ahead and do a auto nami sp uh, swap your spell and then do a staff spec but here at combat dummies i can't really demonstrate that so i'll just do a rotation here without any a pot or anything like that i'll probably end up using limitless on the first couple of thresholds but we will see how that plays out we'll just pop up the dummy here and then we'll target sun and just go for a g conk d breath auto tempest go for the nami we have 45 percent here so i'm going to go for a fsoa into a g conk into a rack and ruin got a decent amount of adren there so we can do our auto wild magic into a two hit is fix g conk charge detonate and kind of rinse repeat from the old rotation Release with an auto attack into a Omni Power, G Conk, into a D Breath, the Auto Ibin, and then into a Tendrils to get some adrenaline back. G Conk, the Wild Magic. And then an auto is fix. And if you want, during the sunshine, you can try and YOLO for another Ibin and save your wild magic as fix for later on. But that is completely optional and you can kind of just improv to find out what works best for you in certain PVMing situations. Now, I want to take this last section here to talk about four ticking and what it is. I'm going to go ahead and do a brief discussion on four ticking and how it works. I have an older video on the channel. It will be linked in the description below where I do a full deep dive on a explaining four ticking but essentially what you're doing is you're using the attack rate of dual wield weapons because they will spam out auto attacks faster think of prod weapons from pvp in old school where you have a whip or a scimitar and you're just attacking a target with the main hand and then you pull out the two hand weapon for the smack hit and at the same attack rate of the sim or the whip or whatever you were using way back in the pvp days you then just pull out a 500 or so on that hit to hopefully 
successfully surprise someone. And essentially you're using that same auto attack speed to then force out auto attacks one tick early because if I go ahead and hit an ability here and let the global cooldown incur and just wait, it takes two game ticks after that global cooldown is done for the auto to come out. But because we are able to keybind spells, you are able to force that out one tick early, thus four tick auto attack is what it's called. Now in keeping this as kind of like the cliff notes version of the other video I did, you cannot four tick after a concentrated blast or an asphyx or a tendrils or I believe even an omni power because I believe it is the last hit of said ability is what will reset. At least on channeled abilities, I think because they do multiple hits in one game tick, they just reset the attack rate back to zero. I think that's what's happening. I could be wrong on that, but if you have a more technical understanding of how the game works in that sense, feel free to leave it in the comments below, but essentially you're not able to Fortech after a G-Conk. So what you would have to do is say you use a G-Conk, you would then press Dragon Breath, put on your staff, and then force the auto out with a staff ability, swap back to your dual wield, press the dual wield ability, swap back, and then auto into whatever you want. But the dual wield ability, just the standard dual wield ability is what a set resets the attack rate so you can then keep forcing out different auto attacks. And what's nice is you can use this to either four tick in blood barrages or ice barrages depending on the effects you need. Or you can use the same strategy to quickly get a smoke cloud on a target or any other effect that you might be using. Again, if you want the full explanation on four ticking and how it works, I do have the video linked below. Now, before I ramble on for probably another half hour to 40 minutes, I think I'm just gonna call the guide here. If you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comments below if you want some further explanation on something. Either someone else in the comment section will be able to help you out or I'll be able to respond to you, no problem. And this guy guide being up will mark the end of the DPS guides for now. I decided against doing necromancy guides for now. I want to focus on the combat triangle specifically because that's what got the update and that's what I'm really interested on making guides and exploring new methods with. And what that means is we are now going to be moving into boss specific guides. I believe I'm going to be starting with Zamorak and moving to some of the other bosses that I really enjoy doing and maybe even revisit some old bosses that I haven't done in quite a while and haven't paid too much attention to, but want to revisit anyways. All right, I'll actually stop rambling now. Thank you all very much for watching. I appreciate your viewership as always. Have a wonderful morning, evening, after nighttime, whatever it is, wherever you are, and I will see you next time for the next guide. Peace.